in this lecture on geo visualization rasagya sharma is going to talk us through some of the key concepts in geographic visualizations uh, using his examples uh, from uh, both uh, digital mapping as well as data visualization companies he is going to illustrates these concepts with very interesting examples so the next uh, topic as i mentioned is going to be about data and we'll see what and how data is important to visualization so um let us start with some frameworks for uh, understanding the progression the hierarchy of uh, what data can do okay so this is uh, called the intelligence hierarchy presented by this guy called nathan shedroff uh, way back uh, 15 years ago when he wrote a very thin book on interaction design and uh, he had a very nice framework for thinking about design okay or different complexities of design right and then the objectives as well associated with that complexity okay so what he said that you know in any kind of a information design or a data visualization progress we move through this intelligences in through this hierarchy of intelligence okay starting with data being the smallest unit or the rawest unit okay so essentially what data is is it is just a bunch of information which is not organized in any manner it does not have any meaning and it does not reveal any insights yet okay now how do you obtain data it is all around us bunch of you here is data okay the lights the uh, the atmosphere inside this room the number of students in the institute trees in the campus number of roads vehicle plying at this moment the weather of mumbai everything is data right but then it is just meaningless unless you begin to organize it in some specific manner okay how do you obtain data through research you can create data you can gather you can discover right these are the processes by which data is available to us okay now the moment you begin to present or organize this okay it it becomes information okay so this is a critical difference between you can actually define one in terms of the other okay you can say data as unorganized information or information as organized data right so they basically the two sides of the same coin okay so you might notice that people use information and data interchangeably but you should know as professional visualization designers this critical difference between right when we refer to data it is just bunch of numbers names or something like that right it does not have any organization therefore it does not have any information okay information on the other hand has some organization right and usually it is driven by the purpose what is it that you want to communicate or derive or know or mean okay so again going back to this very simple example of a bunch of you sitting in front of me in this classroom if i just collect all your names with various attributes attached to that name okay such as can you give me an example what various attributes could be attached to your name data attributes age yes ah how many syllables are there okay okay anything okay so um, the uh, alphabets that are used uh, in okay anything else gender height weight okay <coughs> where you come from what language you speak okay is your hair color black or blonde okay <laughs> here is going to be everything black right uh, what is your eye color okay you can get into i mean you can have as many a uh, number of attitude attributes attached to a name okay now every single thing is called a data point okay a collection of all these things is called a data set right so again you have to know this difference and use it carefully when you do it okay the smallest unit in a data set is a data point okay a bunch of data points form a data set right so um if i have 
uh, these names, okay, the 30 of you here, and uh, some attributes attached. Say there are only four attributes attached to it, okay? And that's a data set with multiple data points, okay? So the number of columns multiplied by the number of rows is the total number of <laughs> points, right? So in other words, you know, what we uh, say in a data set, data set is usually presented in the form of a table or available or gathered or stored in the form of a table, right? Um, and the rows are called as items, okay? So the names in your, uh, in that data set that I was just talking about, the names are the items and the columns are the attributes, okay? Names are attributes, ages are attribute, place of birth is an attribute, place of uh, residence is attribute, okay? Mother tongue, weight, height, all of them are attributes, okay? So essentially the columns are all, uh, all attributes, the rows are, when somebody says that, no, I have a huge data set of two lakh rows, what they mean is it has two lakh items, okay? And uh, the complexity or the size of the data is always expressed in terms of how many rows it has and how many columns it has, right? The more number of columns and rows it has, the bigger the data set, okay? More items, more attributes, bigger data set, okay? As simple as that. Now, coming back to this uh, data set that we have in front of us. So, we have the names and ages and your place of residence and your mother tongue, for example, okay? So, these are the columns that we have, okay? Now, we can have many types of organizations, right? So, starting with the simplest, which is the alphabetical order, right? So, it's just alphabetical order. What is the use of an alphabetical organization? Easy to find it, right? Search and finding, right? If you have a list of 3,000 items, and then if it is organized through some other order, such as, say, your mother tongue or something like that, it is going to be very hard to find it, right? Uh, if you have a, such a large number of rows, then a more natural way to organize them would be, you know, barring that anything else is more important, an alphabetical listing, because at least you can find it, which is why telephone directories are organized alphabetically, right? Uh, if it is just a bunch of states, we have, uh, and then we just organize it according to this thing. So you know where Tamil Nadu is, you know where Assam is, okay? And every state in between. Search and find becomes easy, right? Now, if you, that is not what you want to achieve with that, with, that, with any organization. Suppose you want to find out who is the oldest in the class, who is the youngest in the class, what is the average age of the class, right? What is the mean uh, and the mode? What is the median? Okay, what is the standard deviation of ages? And you want to get into these kinds of insights. What would be, then you have to arrange it differently, right? You would arrange it according to birthdays. Or on the other hand, if you want to find out where you all come from, right? You want to understand, okay, how is this class represented nationally, right? Are there any states that are disproportionately overrepresented and there are any states that are completely underrepresented okay and you want to observe and study this trend of idc students over a period of 5 years right then you kind of your data becomes even more complex right it's not only one table that you are dealing with you are dealing with multiple tables right so think of it as an excel spreadsheet that you know now each of these table is in one tab and each table has its own items and columns and then there are your compri comparing it across a timeline. There is a third dimension that is coming into this, this insight, right? So the purpose here in this case is some others. So depending on whatever is the organization you are out to do, okay, you choose an appropriate, uh, I mean, de depending on whatever meaning is that you want, to, you want to create, you choose an appropriate organization, okay? So that's a critical difference, okay? So this is the foundation of any information design, right? Figure out what organization is the best for whatever purpose that your your uh, your uh, whatever objective it, it is that you 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 have. Okay. So many times, even this very basic thing is not taken care of. Right. You will find organization without any thought of this. Uh, I mean, you you have presentations without any thought for this organization. Okay. So whatever the first organization that comes to your mind 
or whatever the default organization that the data set is presented to you, people will just use that one, like say alphabetical, right? Now alphabetical might not be the most appropriate uh, organization for whatever insight that you're trying to communicate or whatever that you're trying to explore from it, from your data set, right? So figure out, figuring out the right organization is important, right? So that's when it becomes information. Now information is data now with, with some meaning. Hmm? And then the next level of uh, intelligence is when this information trans is becomes knowledge. Okay, translate into knowledge where now you need to create conversations, you need to tell a story, and you need to integrate multiple data. Okay, suppose the story that you want to tell is there are certain states in the country that are traditionally underrepresented, okay, in IDC. Okay, so now that is what you want to find, okay. Is this true? And if it is true, can I show this through data? Okay, so that's a story, okay, very simple story. Okay, now we do not know what the answer to that story is because nobody has done that yet, right? We have data, but we have not done any kind of analysis of that, right? Okay, we can look at 10 years, we can look at 15 years and then figure out how far should we go back to tell this story, okay? Now, you're, you're building a story, okay? So this is where the story part comes in, right? Now you're kind of narrowing it. Data is very broad, right? It is meaningless and it is pregnant with possibilities, right? So you can just about create any insight with it, you can tell any stories with it, right? Now the part where you get to the information and knowledge is when you're narrowing down and it is determined by the purpose that you have. And then the final stage, the holy grail, is wisdom. When the, the knowledge becomes an understanding, okay, in the, in the minds of the receiver, right? Now they are, they are now able to understand, they, they obtain the knowledge and they are able to act upon that knowledge, right? Now why would you do an exercise like what I was trying to do? That the story that I want to tell is uh, that is, there are certain states uh, in the country that are traditionally underrepresented in IDC. Okay, why would I want to tell a story like that? What would be my motivation to do that? To make a change up to what? How can we get more student representation from such states, right? So that you have a more equitable representation, more diversity and so on, right? Say, <coughs> say for example, we find that the northeastern states are very poorly represented, right? Now, you can come to a conclusion immediately that that is true, right? But is that all that is required? No, no. I mean, is that a correct conclusion to have? Okay, you might want to tell this story and you have a data to support it, but are you, are you confident about your finding to a point that, you know, you can propose changes, like you said? Yeah, so you will have to be very thorough about your analysis, right? Now, it may be that, you know, not only IDC is underrepresented, it, it turns out that every institute of higher education and every discipline is also underrepresented. So, in, in a sense that, you know, IDC is not an anomaly, right? So, it is part of a bigger problem, right? So, you cannot just say that, no, let us in IDC do this and then somehow the problem will be solved, right? Maybe the problem now requires intervention at a different level, right? And therefore, you know, the, the, your recommendations would be different in nature, right? So that is what we call it as telling the whole story, right? Not only the limited story. Maybe there are some places where you want to tell a very limited story, right? In order to achieve a goal. And we saw examples of that, you know, in Dr. Snow's map, in, in Florence Nightingale's maps, right? She had a very specific objective of convincing the authorities to do something immediately about which they are totally convinced, but the others are not, okay? And therefore, it made sense to do that. But in some other case, where, you know, your narrow solution might not solve the problem, or it might temporarily solve the problem, but it might end up being creating other problems, right? So you tell the whole story, you make it as comprehensive possible, and then, and then now, it, you know, people are wiser for the better now, right? So they are now able to act upon it because they have a much better understanding of the issue, no, supported by data, 
through your presentation in integration. Okay, so this is where the integration comes, right? Now, the integration is about not only just limited to looking at IDC data set, then you're also looking at other IDCs. Well, you have to expand the scope of your search, right? Now you're now comparing not only, so look at other disciplines in IIT, for example, then look at other IITs, then look at other higher institutes beyond IIT as well, right? So maybe whatever you started with the original hypothesis will dramatically differ from whatever the final conclusions are, right? So they only then, you know, when, when you say somebody is wise, it is not that they have the information or they know something, right? It is because they can understand it, right? And they have part it, they have, they have kind of imbibed it to an extent that they have become wise because they know everything, okay? So you know, you know the problem from every single angle, okay? So what do you have to provide to reach that level? You have to have contemplation, your ways of evaluation, your ways of eva interpretation, and uh, the, uh, the uh, visualization provides play scope for retrospection, right? So this is a, these are all higher orders of thinking, right? If you look at Bl Bloom's taxonomy, right, it, it, it would kind of roughly match uh, the, the wisdom level to the highest order of thinking, right? You're critically thinking about the issue with as much information as you can and cross-referencing uh, as possible, right? So the context, you know, uh, in these uh, cases, you know, where uh, data now from being meaningless to become meaningful, okay, the green circle represents meaning making, okay? So we are involved in the, in the, in the, in the business of meaning making. So there is global, there is local, and there is a personal uh, wisdom that, you know, eventually. Okay, so this is a very useful tool, and since then many people have adopted this framework to think about in a very broad level, okay, so this is not uh, something that uh, Shedroff proposed for uh, data visualization. Uh, he wrote a book on information design and that's what he said and people have adopted it. Uh, David McHandle's of the Information is Beautiful website and the organization, right? Uh, came up with a slightly different variation of the same thing. So he called it the hierarchy of visual understanding and he was not very sure about what he was proposing. So there is a disclaimer there, right? So is it just playing something in this question mark, right? It's a tentative uh, framework is uh, very cautiously putting forward. Uh, and then it's also version 0 0.1, right? Which means that, you know, it is up for revision. Uh, so at the topmost is the pyramid. Okay, so at the bottom most is the data, which is the, the wide, and it is very wide, right? And you're also doing, uh, narrowing it down selectively and you're discarding stuff and so on, right? They are discrete elements, and he has very, this very nice um, comparison. He kind of uh, uh, metaf he has nice metaphors to think of what each of this, uh, them are. No, so they are like words, numbers, code, tables, or databases, right? They are made up of. What do you do with this? You can categorize, you can calculate, you can collate, you can quantify, you can collect them. Okay. So here is where visualization, he says, is, is involved. And then when you start to link elements, right? These are discrete elements. When they become linked elements, so now words become sentences and paragraphs, numbers becomes equations, right? Tables and databases become concepts, ideas, questions, and simple stories, OK? So how do you do it? You contextualize it, you compare it, you converse with it, you connect, you filter, you prioritize, you order, you frame, you frame the problem, right? Then the next level is knowledge. So this is discrete elements, this is in linked elements, and this is organized information, right? So again, you know, extending the same metaphor of words and sentences and paragraphs, now you, we are talking about chapters, theories, axioms, conceptual frameworks, and simple stories become complex stories, and they are also becoming facts now, okay? Because there is enough evidence that they become factual in nature. <coughs> it is not any more hypothesis, okay? And the final uh, apex of this uh, hierarchy is uh, 
when you are able to apply this knowledge, right, then you uh, achieve wisdom. Books, paradigms, systems, churches, <coughs> philosophies, schools of thought, poetry, belief systems, traditions, principles and truths. Okay, so you weave, you embody, discriminate, synthesize. Okay. So almost similar, I mean I cannot find them, he's just using different set of words to explain this concept. And he's even not sure about how do you do that. Okay, so the, what's interesting is that you know the processes he has identified as slightly different, right? At the bottom with data it is visualization, with information it is design, with knowledge it's about mapping and wisdom, you know, he doesn't know. Okay, so uh, so let's get back to you know what is the foundation of data. Uh, so these are some quotes that kind of you know encapsulate the essence of the importance of data. Okay, uh, so Fa Francis Bacon said that whenever you can count. Okay, so I think that was that's like a very good uh, uh, principle to follow, right? You know, I mean, so simple yet it is so profound, right? So I mean, wherever you can just count, right? Uh, one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. In many spheres of human endeavor, from science to business to education to economic policy, good decisions depend on good measurement. Okay, this is Ben Bernanke, who was the Fed chairman under the Obama administration. Uh, Bill Gates, who um, supports a lot of uh, data-driven uh, projects uh, for social causes, you know, his malaria project, for example, is very well known and he is invested quite heavily. His foundation, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, supports a lot of very good projects. But uh, one characteristic uh, one characteristic of all these projects is all it's all highly data driven, measurement based and data driven, okay, and that's what, uh, you know, determines how much funding that gets and how the funding can be extended as well, okay. I've been stuck again and again by how important measurement is to improving the human condition. Measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. If you can't control it, you can't improve it. Okay? So which is where no, you will find the matrices, matrices uh, you know, all around us. You know, we are all trying to quantify, measure everything. You go walk into a shore, uh, store, uh, you know, they want to know how the customer experience has been, right? They, you know, they, pull, they give you a form or they'll, you know, ask you to rate you or something like that. I mean, even the Swiggy Zomato guy asks you to give ratings, right? Uh, and tells you, you know, because it's a way of measurement of the service, right? So, and why th are these organizations so uh, hell-bent on measuring, um, you know, individual parts of the their performances is just so that you know is there some way to improve it. <coughs> so how measurement led to the model? Pre-modern customs were all about dealing with trust, the need for direct supervision, and facing up to enormous risks posed by nature. Once the fundamental measurement problems were solved, involving time, distance, weight, power, among other things, it became possible to cheaply measure worker performance input and output quality and the role of nature in areas of life that were unheard of before okay so there is this school of thought which says that you know i mean there are many schools of thought that tell about you know what made made us modern right what made to the modern human beings you know this the, which which, uh, which which you know demonstrates so much of advancements of the human condition people will say that you know cooking is what made made us modern uh, in the invention of wheel made us modern, in the invention of medicine or whatever, whatever, right? There are so many, uh, you know, everybody will claim that, you know, this is, this is the moment in which the human progress shot up, okay? We were living like this, like savages, and suddenly we invented or we discovered this thing and then things suddenly became different for us, right? But the school of thought, you know, associated with measurement, they say that it is a measurement, our ability to measure is what made us modern. Okay. So this was, you know, from this book by, uh, by D Douglas Allen, uh, "Measurement and the Economic Emergence of the Modern World." 
Okay, so let's look at the idea of measurement itself, right? Can we measure everything? Okay, why are certain things easy to measure and why are certain things harder to measure? Okay, now this is uh, from a website called buckets.com, which uh, um, is kind of geared towards uh, the basketball fans, especially the NBA league. And they provide fantastical statistical representation of player performance, okay? Not just individual player performances, but also team performances and across multiple seasons and so on, okay? And uh, Stephen Curry, most of you would know, is one of the star uh, uh, players. He's a point, he plays at point and he's known for his, what is he known for his? For three point shots, okay? So his speciality is that he can shoot out, out from outside the ring. And uh, usually if you can shoot from outside the ring, then you can, um, you know, basically you're not blocked, right? And therefore you have a free shot at the, uh, at the point, at the hoop, okay? And he's been extremely successful in, uh, in his three point uh, scoring. So uh, there are certain, I mean, there are some seasons, I mean, the, there have been multiple seasons. He has been the MVP, which is the most valuable player, right? That is based on the statistical performance, right? Like number of points scored in every game and so on and so forth, right? Um, so, so basketball as a game has extremely fine-grained measurements of player performance, okay? So everything is can be measured, right? So depend in the, uh, the player can be a forward player, which means that he gets to shoot a lot of points, and player could be a defense player, but each performance can be measured and then compared, okay? So the value of a player to a team and the contribution to the success of a particular team can be precisely quantified. And this data becomes useful for when you're doing the trades at the end of the season, buying players, exchanging players, and all that, right? And this has direct correlation with the performance also, okay? There has been an extremely high correlation between this measurement and the actual performance, okay? 